Okay. Um, good afternoon. Welcome to the Basha seminar again. Um, I think our Greek government still closed, but our Basha seminar still keep going on, uh, as usual. It's my great pleasure to introduce today's seminar speaker, Dr. Michael Lee, uh, who is from uh, Department of Neuroscience of University of Minnesota uh, Medical School and Twin Cities. Michael got his PhD uh, on neuroscience from Johns Hopkins, and Virginia, Virginia. oh, I'm sorry, Virginia actually. <laughs> then he moved to Johns Hopkins to obtain his P uh, postdoc training was down Cleveland. So that's because it's uh, Johns Hopkins. So keep in my mind because he spent so many years there. After his postdoc, he was an uh, instructor, then uh, assistant professor, associate professor. <laughs> After that many years, uh, he moved to University of Minnesota to his current position as a professor at neuroscience and also co-direct of Center for Neurodegeneration Diseases and also the Institute of Translational Neurosciences, right? Uh, Michael's research is last, lastly, largely uh, on generate, generating and also using a mouse model to study neurodegenerative disease, in particular, the models for Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. It has been very well published. Uh, he has listed 28 papers with, with more than 100 citations, and his age index is 36, right? And also very well funded. We're just talking about it's very hard to get fund anyway, you know, anyway, and in particular with some animal models. But uh, Michael's current with multiple grants, including three hour ones. Very impressive. Uh, the topic of his seminar today is uh, neurodegenerations in um, mouse model for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease relevance to disease phenotype and therapeutics. Mike. Well, thank you. Thank you, Yidong, and uh, it's, it's my pleasure to uh, uh, visit San Antonio. It's my first time, although I've been to Houston number of times, but uh, this is my first time in San Antonio, very nice. And uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, sharing our data with you and also uh, meeting some of you uh, some more later. So today I'm going to talk about uh, our studies to define how neurons die as a result of uh, uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease-specific pathology. And, and uh, I'll show you with you why we think that that is important and what it tells us about uh, therapy, therapy development. So um, just before I go on, I just want to acknowledge all the people that are really responsible for the work that, that I'm doing currently. So I'm, I'm uh, at the uh, Institute for uh, Translational Neuroscience, which is located within a new building at University of Minnesota. Uh, you can see kind of an outline in the shadow in the back. And I, uh, my laboratory consists of postdoctoral fellows, students, and scientists. Number of collaborators, and of course, uh, 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 grant supports from uh, NIH, uh, uh, Veterans Administration, and uh, and the private foundations. So, so what is neurodegeneration? So, if you were to define neurodegenerative disease, it's not a clinical phenotype, but neurodegenerative disease is actually a disease in which the nervous system progressively um, and irreversibly deteriorates at structural level. And, uh, and, and two of the major neurodegenerative diseases that I'm interested in uh, is, is a significant public health issue, uh, uh, both, uh, both at the economic level as well as the uh, um, uh, individual cost. Um, but the big problem with these diseases, these late onset neurodegenerative diseases, is that everybody has their own definition. And, and unlike cancer, we cannot really study the intervening stages of the disease. So, so really, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, it's, it's understandable that many people have different ideas about how the disease is caused and how the diseases progress. And, and this. This graph just shows the challenges uh, uh, that are associated with studying late onset neurodegenerative disease. So, so what's shown here is that usually the disease is uh, composed of preclinical stage, 
where you have disease process occurring, but yet the, the, the patient is not diagnosed with disease. And then you have the symptomatic stage where diagnosis occur, and then you have a progressive worsening of the, of the disease uh, phenotype. But as you can see that during the preclinical stage, before the diagnosis, the pathology actually starts uh, 10 to 20 years before the uh, clinical diagnosis of the disease. And uh, which means that many of the um, early events have already occurred by the time someone is diagnosed with the disease. And then you have this progressive neurodegeneration that is, that is probably responsible for the progressive phase of the disease. So, so in order to study all of this, you have to develop a model that is relevant to the, the process of, of, the, of the onset and progression of the disease. And, and, and the approach that we take is, is, is to take advantage of the genetic information. That is that in these two major human neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, there are small subset of individuals. About 10% of the cases, all the, uh, and the rest of the 90% uh, is uh, uh, the disease is caused by uh, unknown um, um, cause. But in the subset of small number of cases, disease is caused by genetic mutations, and some of these genetic mutations are known. So for in Alzheimer's disease, there are mutations in APP and presinol, and in, in Parkinson's disease, you have mutations in alpha synuclein and LARC2. So, so these, these individuals, these, these uh, patients with genetic mutations um, have disease phenotype both at the clinical and at, at the neuropathological level that are virtually identical to the more common sporadic forms. So our, our view is that, that, that the disease caused by these gene mutations will represent the disease process that's occurring in more common uh, sporadic cases. So what we do is that we, we basically make a transgenic animal, and if we're lucky with aging, and this is a very important point because aging is a critical factor uh, in neurodegenerative disease, and in, in, it seems to be the case in animal models as well. When you express these genes, uh, you, if you're lucky, you, you tend to generate neuropatho neuropatho neuropathology that is very similar to what you see in, uh, in human cases. And so when we study these diseases, we tend to uh, compare and contrast both what, what we find in the animal models and what we find in human cases. This is very important because we actually want to study what is actually happening rather than what is possible. As you know, if you overexpress uh, proteins, you can get very off, uh, uh, many effects that may not be related to uh, that, uh, the, or that are relevant to the human, uh, human pathology. So once we have these animal models, then we can actually study the disease mechanism, uh, test them, uh, use them for preclinical therapies, and so on. So, so I'm just going to quickly go over some of the uh, more recent studies from my laboratory. So first, I'm going to try to cover uh, the role of uh, uh, our effort to define neurodegeneration in a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. And this work was mostly done uh, by my prior past, uh, postdoc, Ying Lu, and uh, MJ Yu. And then uh, uh, some of the more recent work was done by the, the uh, individuals in my lab right now. So again, um, AD follows the classic preclinical and, and progressive, progressive post-diagnosis uh, diagnos phase of the disease. And, and you can see here that both aging, genetic, and environmental factors contribute to this increase in uh, uh, brain amyloid, which is thought to be the cause of the Alzheimer's disease. But this brain amyloid increases and plateaus prior to the actual diagnosis of the disease, whereas the progressive phase then is associated with neurodegeneration. So, so our feeling is that, uh, that because even at clinical stages, you, you, the brain is undergoing active neurodegeneration, that we feel that we need to understand how this initial uh, pathology associated with Alzheimer's, disease, namely the amyloid de deposits, are causing neurodegeneration. So, so what is this uh, amyloid pathology? There are two classical pathologies that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. 
One is the extracellular deposits of short peptide called A beta. Uh, these are called, this is called the amyloid deposits or senile plaques. And then the other is the intracellular accumulation or of, uh, of tau protein, which is a microtubule associated protein. And these are called tangles or paradigmatical filaments. So these two things are, uh, uh, that, uh, are classically associated with Alzheimer's disease, whereas but the, only the senile plaques are, are, are selectively associated with, with Alzheimer's disease, where tau pathology is seen in uh, other diseases such as the frontal temporal dementia. So we, we set out to uh, study very simple question. Is, is the A-beta pathology uh, sufficient to initiate neurodegeneration, progressive neurodegeneration in vivo. And we thought that during the uh, uh, late 90s and early 2000s when uh, there was all these animal models with uh, uh, very uh, significant amyloid deposits in the brain that we were, we were going to uh, clearly show that amyloid deposits led to neurodegeneration. It turns out that that, that was not the case. So here's the animal model that uh, that we, we are using. So this is a transgenic animal where we express mutant APP and presynolin genes uh, simultaneously. And these mice then develop very early amyloid deposits, uh, even starting at about four months of age. And then as animals age, you see that they, they develop extensive amyloid deposits throughout the brain. <coughs> and, and these animals are um, unique in that they show cognitive deficit after the, the initial deposition of amyloid in the brain. So the, so the cognitive deficits follow the amyloid pathology, which is, which is somewhat different from some of the widely used models where you can see cognitive deficit prior to amyloid deposits. And this is very similar to what you might see in humans. So when we looked at these animals, we uh, we first uh, did extensive counting of neurons in the cortex and hippocampus. And unfortunately, like others, we did not see significant neuronal loss. And you can see here that this hippocampus here looks pretty identical to uh, young animals, so that there is no noticeable loss of neurons there. And, but there's a lot of amyloid deposits. So, so these results actually combined people to hypothesize that A beta was not sufficient to cause neurodegeneration and that there was something more unique in humans that was driving neurodegeneration in vivo. Yes? So we, so we, did we also look at uh, markers of uh, synaptic, I'm sorry, markers of synaptic terminals um, in, these, in these areas? In other words, whether the synapses were disappearing, right. cell bodies still there. Right. Yeah, so a number of lab, laboratories have looked at uh, uh, integrity of, uh, of presynaptic terminals in these, these and other animal models. In, but in generally, you tend to see uh, loss of slight decrease in presynaptic terminal density within a couple of microns of amyloid deposits, but, but you do not see overall decline in, this, in the presynaptic content. If you were to just run the entire brain and, um, and look for synaptophysin level, for example, you would not see obvious changes. Nothing that, would, no, nothing that would indicate that there was a massive loss of nuance. The brain size actually did not change either. So uh, you may be getting to this, but, but then how, do you, how does that reconcile with the, with the rather marked behavioral? Yeah, so I'll definitely get to this. And if you, if you just uh, 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 allow me a few minutes, uh, and you, can, you can come back to this question later as well. Okay. Excuse me, Dr. Lee. Follow Dr. Strong's question as to the synapse. Um, um, <clears throat> have you, have you all have, have anybody uh, look at whether there's synapse reorganization? Synaptic reorganization. Yes, there will. There, I mean, I'll get. We'll get to that too. Okay. So, so one of the things that that you'll notice is that uh, when you look at literature of uh, um, Alzheimer mouse models, is that. Most people have folk, most people in Alzheimer's disease focus on uh, uh, neurons in the hippocampus or cortex. But upon uh, doing some research into uh, uh, older literature, 
especially the, some of the classic works by Brock and others who have really characterized the sequence of uh, pathology that occurs in human Alzheimer's disease cases. What we noticed was that monoaminergic neurons, so these are, these are neurons that make uh, serotonin or no no, no, uh, no epinephrine. And they have cell bodies in the brainstem where there is no amyloid pathology, but they have extensive projection afferents into the cortex. So these neurons develop neurodegenerative changes at the earliest stages of Alzheimer's disease. So earlier than most of the cortical regions. So, so we decided to examine whether this feature was recapitulated uh, in our mouse model of amyloid deposits. So what we, so what we decided to do is look at the integrity of the, of the monoaminergic system. So this is, the, this is, this is published uh, work a couple of years ago uh, in general science. And you can see here, um, so this is a, a section stain, double st immunostain for serotonin and amyloid in blue. And this is TH and amyloid. So, so it, this is cortex, so this would be serotonin and this would be no adrenaline, no epinephrine uh, afferents. And you can see here at, uh, at four months of age, there's very little uh, changes associated with the axons, whereas by 12 months of age, you see that these dense dystrophic um, uh, neurites are associated with uh, amyloid deposits. And then at, at a more uh, uh, global level, what you see is that uh, at four months of age, uh, the overall, uh, overall density of the serotoninergic and, uh, and noadrenergic afferents are not different when animals are younger. So this is a four months of age when they're just starting to develop amyloid deposits. But as animals age as, and, and the, their amyloid uh, deposits accumulate, you see that there's a uh, significantly noticeable reduction in the, in the overall uh, integrity of the both serotoninergic and noadrenergic fibers. And then we used a special method, stereological approach called a, a, a spherical probe analysis to define the actual length of, of, uh, of these afferents. And you can see that, you can see that there is a, um, a age-dependent decrease uh, in, in the overall density and length of these fibers. So, so about at 12 months of age, you get about 50% loss. And by the time you get to uh, 18 months of age, you get, you get up to 70, 80 percent reduction in the density of these fibers. So the next question we asked was that, so when you lo you're losing these afferents, so what, what, what's happening to their cell bodies? So remember that at 12 months, you have 50 percent reduction uh, and a greater reduction at 18 months. So this is, uh, this is a section stain for either serotonin or TH. Uh, this is dorsal raphe, which will be serotoninergic neurons, and this is locus aurelius. And you can see at 12 months of age, they do not, there is no difference in number of neurons between the normal and the, and the, uh, uh, the mice that have uh, uh, significant amyloid deposits in the cortex. But by 18 months of age, you see that there is about 40 to 50 percent reduction in actual number of neurons. This is more than just loss of phenotype by the neurons because if you count the neurons that are not uh, uh, labeled by the neurotransmitter markers, that there is no change. So there is no increase in neurons. So, so obviously, this represents actual loss of uh, uh, serotoninergic and, and noadrenergic neurons rather than uh, loss of phenotype. So significantly, uh, uh, the uh, neurons that are uh, in the uh, uh, ventral midbrain, so this, this is a dopaminergic neurons that uh, they are, the, so the neurons that are projecting to the um, striatum, which, which is a compact neuron. So these neurons generally are more sensitive to environmental toxins and other manipulations. They are not affected by this amyloid deposits, whereas the VTA neurons, which projects the cortex where the significant amyloid deposits are, are, are clearly lost 
upon uh, with, with aging. So overall, so we, we come up with this hypothesis um, where we believe the toxicity in these uh, animals or amyloid deposits cause distal toxicity first at the axon terminals. And then you, you have a synaptic pathology followed by uh, uh, axonopathy, and then eventually uh, you, lose, uh, you lose the cell bodies. What's interesting is that both in, uh, in humans and mouse, uh, these locus ceruleus and serotonin neurons that project down to the cortex do not show neurodegenerative changes indicating that, uh, that, that the, that the uh, projection to the cortex is required for this, these degenerative changes. So, so why isn't there this massive neurodegeneration in a mouse? And I, we believe that it, this represents the fact that mouse brain is just smaller than human brain. So if you were to hypothesize that some of these pathologies actually is uh, related to absolute length of the axons, you get to a point where in, in, the, in the hippocampus and the cortex, the, the, the connections there, intercortical connections, are much shorter than, than both the, uh, both the brain, uh, projections of the brainstem neurons as well as the, uh, uh, the, the interneuronal, intercortical or interneu uh, inter, uh, um, interneuronal connections that are present in human brain. So we believe that that's the big difference between the mouse brain and human brain regarding neurodegeneration. Additionally, we're excited by this because we think that the amyloid pathology not only is a marker for neurodegeneration, but it actually participates in the further progression of Alzheimer's disease. So, so for example, there, there has been studies where uh, if you were to lesion a locus ceruleus neurons, noetonergic neurons, in another uh, animal models of Alzheimer's disease, that loss of uh, noadrenergic afferents leads to increased amyloid pathology and uh, 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 greater cognitive deficits. There has been studies where if you uh, treat uh, uh, this uh, tranquilophilus 3XTG mice with uh, uh, paroxetine, you can, you can reduce the, the, uh, the onset of uh, 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 Alzheimer's-like pathology, and so on. So we believe that, that, that this loss of serotonin may be a critical uh, therapeutic, potential therapeutic target uh, that, that could lead to uh, slowing of uh, uh, AD progression. And, and so, so the ne next question that we asked was that, if that's true, then does the integrity of monoimagic neurons um, do they, do, do, they, uh, do they change with the cognitive status uh, in, in humans? So, so to address this, what we did was uh, we took advantage of uh, uh, material from uh, Nunn study, which recently moved over from Kentucky to University of Minnesota, where Sisters of Notre Dame uh, donated uh, their brains after being evaluated uh, a year, for years and years uh, regarding their um, uh, cognitive function. So in this case, so in, in a lot of these cohorts, uh, what you have is that you have individuals that have very high Alzheimer's-like pathology. But, but, you, but a lot of them uh, have Alzheimer's-like pathology in the brain, and they're demented, so they have diagnosis of AD. But it turns out that some of the uh, individuals without any dementia also had just as much Alzheimer's-like pathology in their brain. So we call these uh, um, uh, uh, non-demented Alzheimer's pathology group, uh, but other people call it preclinical AD. There, there are the various names for it. But, but you can see that this is a quantitation of uh, 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 neurofibrillary tangles and senile plaques uh, in, in various uh, forebrain regions, and they're, they're virtually identical. But uh, the non-demented group show uh, uh, more intact cognition compared to the Alzheimer's disease group. And we examined these uh, individuals uh, um, for the tau, their tau presence of tau pathology in the locus cerulealis and, and also um, in the, in the, in the RAFA. So this is, uh, uh, this is, this is a uh, semi-quantitative analysis 
and this is more quantitative analysis, or this is subjective analysis, and this is more of a quantitative analysis, uh, showing the percent of um, TH positive or serotoninergic neurons that have uh, uh, tau pathology in them. And what you can see here is that uh, people that have not, so you got to remember, these individuals had the same amount of cortical pathology. But if you, in the, in the, in the, in the else, locus surrealis and in the RAFA, the non-demented group have significantly lower level of tau pathology uh, in, 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 uh, in these neurons, indicating that there, there's some, something that's protecting them at the terminal where the, the, these neurons are so much in, there's an inherent difference in, uh, in these neurons in response to uh, uh, amyloid pathology. And of course, if you, if you also examine the amount of neurites that have tau pathology, uh, the AD group is much higher than the non-demented AD group. So we believe that this neural degeneration of monoimmunogenic neurons in AD is a, is, a, uh, is a significant factor determining both the uh, that, that may, that may give us clues about therapeutic targets as well as put, uh, what a uh, potential basis for vulnerability in Alzheimer's disease. Additionally, because these uh, afferents are, uh, can be examined using PET imaging, uh, uh, these, these neurodegenerative markers could actually be additional uh, out there, outcome measure for disease progression or therapeutic efficacy. And obviously, we're doing additional study to really trying to get, get into details about what underlies, what are the additional factors that are involved in neurodegeneration. So I'm going to switch gears and talk about Parkinson's disease. Question? Yeah. Um, okay. If you, look at the local, if you look in the local area, for example, in the human material or in your mouse models, what, what's going on? Um, around the plaque where you see neurodegeneration, loss of neurons. What's going on with the microglia, the somatic cells, the monocytes, uh, T cells? Uh, what sort of inflammatory stuff is going on around there? And, and also, what, what does that have any effect on the astros? You know, what sort of inflammatory stuff is going on around that you can actually see with a microscope and stain? So this is, this is a really a great question because obviously um, when you have these type of changes in the brain, you are going to make, you're going to induce changes in the, in the supporting uh, cells, astrocytes, microglia, oligodendrocytes. And, and I think that, I think that those, those uh, changes um, are clearly a focus of interest in multiple labs, including ours. And I think that I think that th those need to be evaluated. I mean, we have evidence indicating that uh, uh, some of the some of the effects definitely are associated with the microglial reaction. Um, so that, that, can you tell whether that correlates with cognitive decline or not? The presence or absence, or just are in fact some subjective way that can measure the degree of inflammation, inflammatory response? There are there are there are people that have. Uh, correlated that uh, certainly we have not, but uh, but definitely uh, and and you know no no for example no adrenergic um, afferents so the brain no adren uh, no norepinephrine is known to uh, also regulate uh, in inflammation as well as well as the blood uh, uh, cerebral blood flow so so all of those things probably will correlate we we just I just personally have not done it but there are a number of great studies showing that that the amount of inflammation clearly is associated with the, some of the cognitive phenotypes that you see. In, in, in humans, um, uh, I think that's been more difficult uh, because it's, it's, you know, they're looking at large areas. But generally, the more advanced Alzheimer's disease cases are that you tend to have more microglial reaction around the plaque. I'm pretty sure that you um, get this question very frequently, but I would just like to, to hear the response. So if the serotonergic or the adrenergic afferents are crucial um, 
to, for instance, making the difference between actually being a high pathology control or a, mm -hmm. um, so uh, is there any evidence that SSRIs or, well, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors have not done much for the disease, but SSRIs, I mean, so many people are taking them. Is there any uh, epidemiological evidence that, uh, you know, at least for a while, maybe while these neurons, these neurons are actually dying, maybe it's just keeping this, you know, serotonergic inputs right. would, for a little while, obviously. So. That's a tough question. So there are a couple. So SSRIs depend on intact afferents, and um, I think the uh, by the time Alzheimer's patients get depressed, they're they're so far along, and there may not be much to uh, react. But there are other studies that support this view. So number one, there has been studies where. Uh, um, uh, Yavit Shalin from uh, St. Louis, she, she, she actually, they, they've looked at uh, uh, humans with S, uh, that are treated with SSRIs, and they show that they actually have lower A beta levels in the brain. Oh, really? Yeah. And I have a colleague at uh, Johns Hopkins uh, using PET imaging. So she's interested in uh, uh, geriatric uh, uh, psychiatry uh, or, or uh, behavioral uh, issues. And so they've looked at uh, elderly individuals that were treated with SSRIs, and they have less PIB binding. So PIB is a PET imaging ligand for A-beta, and they have a lower PIB binding with SSRI treatment. So obviously more work needs to be done, but I think there, there, is, there is evidence to indicate that this, this could, be, could be a useful approach. In addition, SSRIs start to induce a, uh, BDNF and so on, so it might, it might be okay. I think, and I, I believe that there are some trials uh, 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 utilizing both NRE, uh, the, the uh, NET inhibitors, uptake inhibitors, as well as, uh, um, um, as the SSRIs for early AD cases. So let me just switch gears for Parkinson's disease. So I just want to go over a little bit of a background on Parkinson's disease. So, so Parkinson's disease traditionally has been associated with the loss of uh, dopaminergic neurons in the ventral midbrain. So, the, and, and uh, this area is called substantia nigra because the, the pigment in the neurons make these cells or this region appear uh, uh, black. And, um, and in Parkinson's patients, these neurons are lost, so you see much paler appearance and loss of neurons. So, loss of these neurons are thought to, uh, thought to be responsible for the uh, for the motor, the, the obvious motor aspects of Parkinson's disease, and and this is this is the, the basis for all the uh, dopamine replacement therapy as well as the uh, therapy involving uh, surgical procedures and deep brain stimulation. But in the recent uh, uh, in the recent decade, I guess with the uh, with the identification of some of these some of these genetic mutations that are causing Parkinson's disease, there has been uh, slow shift towards uh, in, uh, interest in these intraneuronal inclusions called Lewy bodies and Lewy neurites uh, that, uh, that, that are uh, often classical hallmarks of idiopathic Parkinson's disease. And uh, it is thought that, that these, uh, these, these uh, intracellular inclusions are responsible for the progressive neurodegenerative aspects of PD. And but if, if, the, if the dopamine replacement therapy is so effective, why do we care about neurodegeneration? Because, because really the, the loss of dopamine only represents very tip of the iceberg in terms of a disease called Parkinson's disease. And actually, I kind of adopted this picture from, uh, um, uh, uh, from, uh, from other clinicians, but to, to represent the fact that that there, there's this been sort of this exodus from dopamine-centric to more global view of Parkinson's disease. And it is thought that, so in addition to the, to the loss of dopamine or Parkinsonism, uh, the Parkinson's disease is associated with significant other uh, non-dopaminergic, non-motoric uh, uh, features, which is often more debilitating uh, than, than the motor symptoms caused by loss of dopamine. And, and we believe that, that, or many of us believe that this, these non-motor symptoms 
uh, arise because of uh, 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 alpha <coughs> this Lewy body pathology. And, and we believe that in order to really uh, have an effective treatment for the disease, we need to understand how to stop neurons from dying from this Lewy body pathology. Additionally, um, the idea that this Lewy body pathology might be important comes from uh, genetic, uh, or, uh, uh, genetic information, and it, it has a direct implication in our approach to trying to model uh, uh, Parkinson's disease or, 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 or features that are relevant for Parkinson's disease. So, so since, uh, since the uh, uh, early 2000, late 1990s, um, it, with the initial, initial identification of mutation in alpha synuclein, which, by the way, is, is the key structural component of those Lewy bodies that aggregate in, inside the cell, there has been a number of additional uh, mutations that are known to cause Parkinson's disease have been identified. Uh, and and they, they can be classified as two, two large groups. One is autosomal dominant forms, and the other one, uh, so such as Parkin, are called autosomal recessive. So in that case, it's, it's thought to be loss of function, and you have, you have to have a both copies that are mutated. And if you, if you look at the clinical features of, and the neuropathological features of the autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive disease, and compare them with sporadic PD, what you see is that the autosomal dominant forms, which is associated with alpha synuclein mutation and formation of Lewy bodies, actually is very similar to what you find in the more common sporadic or idiopathic Parkinson's disease. Whereas the autosomal recessive disease, although they have a very nice Parkinsonism, they do not fully recapitulate all the features or the progressive nature of the, of the idiopathic PD. So we, we decide, we, so our view is that potentially these two represent two different pathways to Parkinsonism and that autosomal dominant forms, especially ones that are related to alpha synuclein abnormality, is, uh, is relevant for, uh, for understanding neurodegeneration in, in, in the more common sporadic PD. So, so this is just a cartoon showing that we believe uh, we put alpha synuclein at the at this kind of a critical juncture that's leading to many of the uh, pathological abnormalities that are associated with Parkinson's disease. So, what is alpha synuclein? So, synuclein alpha synuclein is a member of a, a multi gene family. Uh, in, in mammals, it consists of alpha, beta, and gamma synuclein. They're highly enriched in presynaptic terminals. Uh, it is thought that they uh, serve a uh, as a synaptic chaperone. Some of these uh, work by Tom Sudoff and others. Uh, they, they seem to regulate vesicular release. Um, and, and in alpha synuclein, there's been a number of uh, uh, point mutation as well as duplication and triplication of wild type gene that uh, leads to uh, uh, Parkinson's disease in humans. So the first thing is, do alpha synuclein abnormality sufficient to cause neurodegeneration uh, in vivo? So, so what we did was we, make, we made transgenic animals expressing ver various uh, 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 point mutations. And, and, uh, and what we found is that the animals that are expressing the A53T mutation, which was the major, the, the first mutation that was identified, um, started to show a very early mortality uh, that was, that was uh, inversely correlated with the amount of protein expression. So ones that have very high protein expression had very short lifespan compared to the others. And, and that this is sort of a, I guess, if you were to be a mouse neurologist, a, uh, what, what the motoric symptoms in the, in the animals look like. So you can see that, so this is the uh, transgenic animal where it rapidly progresses to mid-stage And you see a significant dystonia. Okay, so this this occurs very rapidly after initial onset, uh, uh, and within within uh, 20 days of initial onset of disease, animal becomes completely uh, moribund. And 
and it, uh, neuropathologically, they show um, uh, significant signs of neurodegeneration or neuronal abnormality, including um, astroglio and microglial reaction. They show uh, uh, accumulation of alpha synuclein and uh, uh, ubiquitin, as well as phosphorylated neurofilament. And some of the, uh, many of these inclusions obviously are fibrillar inclusions, as indicated by this diaflavin um, uh, positive uh, uh, staining. Additionally, in addition to the, these uh, indicator of uh, inclusion, the, the aggregation of alpha synuclein in these animals seem to be very similar to what you see in human disease. So this, this is actually from a paper where we identified C-terminal truncation that promote aggregation. But what you can see here is that, so this is an insoluble aggregated alpha synuclein that came from the transgenic animal. And then this is the um, insoluble alpha synuclein that came from the uh, human PD cases. And you know, while there are some quantitative differences, qualitatively, and we've verified this using mass spec as well, that they, they, the aggregates consist of very similar, almost identical uh, species of alpha synuclein. So we've been studying this uh, animal model for um, several uh, years now. And we have uh, uh, identified many different um, abnormalities that occur as a consequence of alpha synuclein pathology. But one of the first things we did was we actually tried to identify some of the factors that may lead to conversion of alpha synuclein. Particularly, what, may, what are the factors that may um, contribute to conversion of normal alpha synuclein in, in, without any mutation to a pathogenic form? And, and this. This came about try, uh, from trying to understand the dynamics of alpha synuclein expression uh, as animal ages. So, so aging is a significant factor here. So what we found is that if you look at alpha synuclein mRNA, and in fact other mRNA that encodes for a protein that are enriched at the synaptic terminal, what you see is that initially with, with maturation, there's a significant increase in mRNA. And then as the animal ages, the mRNA goes way down. And you can, you can see that it's, it's uh, labeled here, OK? But if you probe for the protein that is encoded by those mRNA, so here, here we are. Here's a synapsin 1, synaptophysin, uh, synapsin, and beta synuclein, alpha synuclein, what you see is that the protein level goes up with the mRNA, but then it never comes down. It stays apart. There are two, two, two conclusions from this. One is that a unit of mRNA is making more protein, most unlikely, or the protein becomes extremely stable. So it just lives around, you know, just hangs around longer. And in fact, that's, that is the case. So, so this is one of the, uh, um, experiments we did to verify that fact, which is we, we cultured neurons, and uh, we did pulse chase analysis for alpha synuclein degradation um, uh, at different maturation state of these neurons. And what you can, what you can see is that at one week, of, uh, uh, one week in vitro, uh, the synuclein turnover, the half-life is about 40 hours. But as, as the neurons mature, you see it goes from 40 hours to almost 160 hours. And this increase, uh, 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 we have now these inducible mouse models, and we can actually verify similar kind of events occurring in vivo as well. Additionally, not only uh, does this occur in mouse, but we see the similar uh, process in human brain. So in humans, what you see is that mRNA levels either, either, either slightly decrease or uh, decrease significantly for alpha synuclein. But, but the protein levels actually goes up. And it goes up particularly uh, 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 significantly in the substantia nigra. So here in the substantia nigra, with aging, the difference between someone who's in the, their 50s versus someone in their 80s plus 
is almost twofold. So this is almost like having a triplication mutation of alpha synuclein without any mutation. So yeah. that only happened to this particular protein, or they happened to a group of protein, or everything? We, we, we only looked at the synucleins, and only the alpha synuclein did, made it uh, show this uh, feature. And I imagine, uh, you know, uh, and, but I think this other synaptic protein clearly is maintaining that high levels, and that's been shown by other people as well. So that probably, this decrease in turnover of synaptic proteins has a lot to do with uh, the lack of synaptic plasticity as we age and lack of recovery. Can I ask you one thing? Yes. <clears throat> so I'm wondering um, whether you measure the proteasomal activity, whether it's going down with, the, with the, this time frame that you, uh, you looked at it? Your proteasomal functions, uh, whether they are going down when you see the accumulation of your alpha synuclein protein, and at the same time with the proteasomal activity dropped? No, we have not looked at that. Um, I think that's, there are a couple of issues. One, that that assumes that synuclein is degraded by proteasomes, and we do not believe that. There are, I think there are a number of studies now that show that synuclein in fact, is not degraded by proteasomes. That's number one. And I think there are some evidence to indicate that it, with aging, the, all of the protein degradation pathway, not just the proteasomes, but UPR and autophagy, the extent of autophagy <coughs> decreases. So, so I think that, that that's a reasonable assumption that there is a decrease. Okay. Well, I have one thing. I, the, hello? Yeah. Yeah, so it could be possible that you see the, these are all reduced gel, right? When you do the Western blood, it's all reduced gels, like with the DGT, your on VME in the, in the gel, right? So you don't, my, my question is that these are the aggregates of the expressions. It could be possible that one, the, the state of the molecule you are looking of the alpha synuclein, it could be um, cross-link products. And not, these, not may not be the expressions. Right. These, are, these are monomers? No, I'm saying the cross-link products, like tyrosine, tyrosine cross-linking can happen, which will stay together. Is it all monomers or is it different? But the di tyrosine, di tyrosine cross-links uh, will, will not reduce separation. That's what I'm saying. So you right, so the, and they would, they would actually run at a higher molecular weight. So, so we're, just, the higher molecular weight. we're just measuring, we're just, we're just measuring the monomer. Uh, oh, just the monomer? Yeah, just the monomer as shown here. And these are... And there may be some uh, crosslinks. I mean, uh, there are people that have looked at that, looking, they are looking at that, but we, we didn't look at it in this paper. Um, and these are actually cases that do not have any neurological diseases. These are, these are normal control brains. So we were just looking at what is the status of alpha synuclein as a one uh, individual, individual's age. Okay. So, so this is just a, uh, a model that we, we came up with, which is that um, in the uh, young individuals, uh, uh, you know, you have a lot of synuclein being made and uh, um, very high turnover. And when you have a, when you have a um, high turnover, the turnover state of protein is also direct inversely proportional to, to a, how much damage that protein could accumulate. So, so, for example, these, these little uh, um, uh, red uh, 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 features are, are the, um, I guess, ones that accumulate, for example, protein carbonyl or oxidative modification, and, and they're just hanging out. And so they have a longer time to convert to pathogenic species. And, but with aging, because the, the, the synthetic rate is very low, the, these, these, and the degradation rate is also very low, that these proteins can accumulate damage and have chance to convert to these pathogenic species. What I didn't show you, but it's in the paper, is that the mutations will also slow the half-life of the protein. So, so if you compare the half-life of A53T mutant alpha synuclein versus wild type, the A53T mutant is 50% more stable in terms of half-life than, than the wild. So the experimental verification of uh, uh, accumulation of oxidative damage to alpha synuclein is shown here. So, so what's, what this is, that this is an oxyblot analysis of 
uh, synuclein that's immunoprecipitated from a young human or mouse compared to the old human or mouse. And you can see that the synuclein from the older subjects have accumulated oxidative damage, but not the younger subjects. So we also um, uh, went on to look at other uh, parameters that may um, uh, lead to uh, or age-related parameters. And one, one, of the, one of the things that are often associated with aging in many different models is uh, unfolded protein response or ER stress. And uh, so endoplasmic reticulum is very active uh, in, ter in terms of trying to uh, uh, um, uh, 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 fold proteins. So it has a very high uh, um, proteostatic load. And it turns out that um, accumulation of misfolded proteins can induce um, ER stress. And, and if this ER stress is not abated by these uh, unfolded protein response, which is a concerted effort by the cell to clear the, clear the ER and cells of this misfolded protein. If that is not abated, then you, you can have uh, 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 activation of cell death pathway. So in, in mouse, you have uh, activation of caspase 12 and, and, uh, and uh, epitotic cell death. So we decided to see whether, since we see this uh, uh, accumulation of misfolded alpha synuclein in, in, the, in, the, uh, in, in the neurons, whether, whether the, the mice actually show signs of ER stress in their brain. So one of the classic uh, markers of ER stress is increase in ER chaperones. And what you see here is that at pre-symptomatic stage, so these are aged animals, but they have not shown any neuropathology. You see that the, the level of ER chaperone uh, is uh, comparable to the controls, but as animals start to develop disease, you can see that there is a significant increase in the level of ER chaperone. So the, these, these are classic ER chaperones, GRP uh, 94, 78, and uh, PDI. But if you, if you look at the same aged animal, so this is the end-stage animal, but in a region of the brain that have significant amount of alpha synuclein expression but do not show any pathology, you do not see any um, induction of ER chaperone, indicating that the induction of ER chaperone is selectively associated with the uh, uh, presence of alpha synuclein pathology. And you, you can see here that this is a uh, double uh, uh, immunofluorescence analysis visualized by confocal microscopy. And you can see that the red is the ER chaperone, and the blue is the uh, 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 marker uh, antibodies that, that uh, react with the pathologic form of alpha synuclein. You can see that, that, so these two neurons, they both show ER chaperone. But this neuron show a very high level of GRP94, and that's the neuron that contained the synuclein pathology. And similarly, this one contains synuclein pathology, but this one does not. And when you quantify this, the, uh, the, the, the cells that have uh, uh, abnormal alpha synuclein in them have significantly higher level or staining for the, for the various uh, respective ER chaperones. Additionally, we believe that alpha synuclein is causing ER stress not just by aggregating in the cytoplasm, but directly interacting with some component in the ER. And the re reason why we think that is, um, is that we find that alpha synuclein is selectively found associated with endoplasmic reticulum enriched fraction biochemically, but not beta synuclein. So, so alpha and beta synuclein, they're very high sim highly similar protein. They both uh, uh, interact with membranes and so on, but only alpha synuclein associated with the ER. Additionally, it seems that alpha synuclein is not just associated with ER, it actually goes inside the ER. So for example, this is a study where um, uh, we took the microsomes and we treated the microsome with the protease. So if, if the protein is on the outside, it would just be degraded. But, but alpha synuclein, just like the ER resident GRP78, is completely protected. Uh, with, by protease, whereas uh, when you add the detergent, it's completely degraded. And we, we can also um, 
show that alpha synuclein is in the ER using uh, immuno EM analysis. Another thing that we found uh, uh, is, so I just want to quickly go over this, uh, um, is that we found these uh, oligomeric forms of high molecular forms of alpha synuclein in the soluble fraction that we get from the, from the ER enriched fractions. So not just the insoluble, fraction, insoluble form, but the soluble. So we thought that uh, this, this, was, uh, this was pretty uh, interesting, and, and we thought that maybe this is what we would call toxic oligomers. So it's, toxic oligomers in the synuclein field is almost like a unicorn that it's, it's, it's kind of thought, talked about, but nobody has ever seen it, except in in vitro conditions. And what it is is that, is that in addition, so these, a lot of these uh, 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 proteins that aggregate not only can aggregate into these long fibrils, but they could also form these, these oligomers that, that thought to be forming these pores that can cause membrane disruption. So, so in order to define, um, to, to, under, to, de uh, to, to determine whether these could actually represent uh, toxic oligomers, what we did was instead of just relying on the, uh, uh, the, the, the difference in mobility on a SDS page, what we did was we did a dot plot analysis using two antibodies that are known to be selective for uh, uh, toxic oligomers. So one is called um, A11. This is an antibody that was, my, uh, uh, that was generated from uh, Charlie Glaive's lab. Um, and it's specific for all soluble oligomers, including A beta and so on. And then we have a FILA one, which is specific for alpha synuclein oligomers. So, so what you see here is that this is a triton insoluble aggregate that we get from the mouse brain. So this is a total aggregate that, that you see when you stain the, the neurons. And you know, there's plenty of alpha synuclein. There's a phosphosynuclein. SYN303, so these are actually markers of aggregated alpha synuclein. But they're completely not rea unreactive to the anti-oligomer antibody. What's interesting is that the synuclein in the microsomes are highly reactive for both FILA1 and A11. And what's even more interesting is that before animals are sick, before animals show phenotype, before, before they show aggregated alpha synuclein in the microsomes, they show FILA1 and A11 reactivity, indicating that some of these oligomers are forming prior to actual onset of disease. So it's, so, so it's at the right time to be the causative factor for the further progression of the disease. So remember I told you that we want to understand what really is happening, particularly in humans, and not just what is possible in our experimental system. And this is another example, because this, this is a very important idea, that the synuclein goes into ER and forms these oligomers. So what we did was we decided, uh, we, we, we uh, try to examine whether in human cases that there is accumulation of these oligomers in the, uh, in the ER or in the microsomes. So these, this is not the, the most straightforward studies because it's post-mortem tissue and so on. But regardless, what you see is that, um, that indeed, in the Parkinson's disease case, there is significant amount of FILA1 and A11 reactivity associated with microsomes, much higher than in the control cases. And when you, when you examine the detergent inside, in other words, these are the, what most people would analyzed as aggregates, uh, they, there is no difference between PD and control cases, even though there's plenty of alpha synuclein there. So this is, this is a pretty nice parallel to what's going on in animals, or animal is reflecting what is going on in, in the human case as much as we could expect. So this, so so just general view now is that the synuclein goes into the ER, aggregates and causes ER toxicity. Is there cell death? I mean, is, is there evidence that there is ER activated cell death program is being activated? So there are one, the first sign is that um, 
oh, I missed a slide. But what we see is that there is a, there is a clear um, uh, 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 activation of cast spaces, including cast space 12 with onset of disease. But most important, if, if you attenuate ER stress, you can increase the lifespan in these animals. So the experiment here is that there's a compound called soluberanol, uh, which inhibits dephosphorylation of, one of, of EIF2 alpha uh, um, uh, uh, that occurs, the phosphorylation of EIF2 that occurs uh, during, uh, as a part of an uh, unfolded protein response. And, it, and, and it, it has been shown that if you, if you inhibit this dephosphorylation of phospho-ERF2 alpha, you can protect cells against chronic UPR, uh, ER stress-induced cell death. So we, we treated the animals at 12 months of age uh, with either vehicle or soluberanol. And what you, what you can see is that soluberanol-treated uh, animals have their lifespan extended on average by several months. So th these, these four months here represent something in, in, uh, in order of 15 uh, uh, years, equivalent years in mouse, uh, if you were to move that to humans. I mean, it's, it's kind of stupid, but that's, that's what it is. I'm just trying to tell you that this, this effect is pretty dramatic for these type of studies. Additionally, soluberanol treatment reduces ER associated of alpha synuclein, but not total alpha synuclein. And, and, and consequently leads to reduction in uh, um, ER-associated oligomers. So this is, a, this is our working hypothesis, where um, normally some fraction of alpha synuclein goes into the ER. And, and then for some reason, the, the alpha synuclein starts converting to pathogenic oligomers. And this may actually occur as a normal consequence of aging. And then once, once that seeding occurs, then you have the progression of accumulation leading to complete ER failure and neurodegeneration. And, we, and, and then we also believe that this pathway could be a therapeutic target for disease-modifying therapy in Parkinson's disease. And, and I, I don't have time to go, but there are, there are clearly a number of other pathways. They're all related to aging, oxidative stress, autophagy. Huh? <laughs> No, but any, so, so I hope I've shown you that, that, that you can study neurodegeneration that's relevant to human disease in, a, in, a, in, a, in an animal model, and that, that these studies may represent a significant therapeutic hope for a devastating disease for all the patients. Thank you. Michael. Great, great work. So I have a question uh, in your first part about the uh, model, I mean, neurotic neuron death in the, um, in the APPPS1 mice. So you observe the VTA region neuron loss in that model at uh, 18 months of age, right? Do you, my quick question is, do you, the same phenomenon happens in other A-beta model? Right, so, so the question is whether this loss of model energetic neurons occurs in other models because it is true that it could be something peculiar about this double transgenic mm -hmm. animal, yeah. right? And, and in, indeed it does. So we are looking at uh, PET-inducible okay. conditional APP transgenics where, where there um, the, the APP transgene, the mutant APP is only expressed in the forebrain and only the mutant APP express, not, not, not mutant presenolin, because obviously, if, if you know Alzheimer's disease, presenolin itself could have effect. And they, they show even, even more pronounced progressive neurodegeneration. Okay, yeah. Not monoimaging neurons. Yeah, that's great. So I have a follow up question. So you seem to imply that the, um, those, those neuron degeneration is caused by the uh, tau, cumulative tau. But that, and those no, don't what have I'm a trying very to right. So, so the so the view, the existing view, the the current view, at least I mean, view prior to these studies was that tau pathology was required, and I, I think what I'm implying is that, at least in this model, um, 
we've looked at tau pathology and they're not present. So, so the tau pathology is not required. But that is not to say the tau pathology is not involved. So in human, you know, human tau is different than mouse tau. So in none study, the reason why we get tau pathology maybe is, you know, probably is because they're human tau. So we have mating going on with the amyloid transgenics with the human tau uh, pack mice, which expresses the wild type human tau. And, and uh, we believe in those mice, we'll get, uh, we'll get induction of uh, tau pathology in those neurons as a result of distal uh, exposure to amyloid pathology. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes. So I'm going to give you a good reason to keep going on with this slide. So I saw your number two and number three item with uh, alpha C nuclein is oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction. Right. Uh, so is sort of like an independent pathway for this ER stress also, or relatively related to this ER stress? So we can cause mitochondrial abnormality independent of ER stress at least in a model system. But in an in vivo context, the problem is that all of these components are interrelated. Autophagy, mitochondria, and ER, they, they, they are not separable. So what's your evidence for this alpha synuclein with oxidative stress and mitochondria dysfunction you have? Well, we are, uh, so, We, we have evidence that alpha synuclein accumulates, selectively accumulates oxidative stress with aging, and it has a lot of modification. And we're not the only group that have looked at that. And, uh, and then the mitochondrial abnormality, I mean, um, we are getting pretty similar to what other people have shown. So the, there was a JB Journal of Biological Chemistry paper, I believe, uh, a couple of years ago that shows that alpha synuclein goes into the mitochondria and inhibits complex one. And there are other, paper, other papers, I believe, from uh, Bob Nussbaum's group showing that regions of alpha synuclein interact with complex one subunits. So, 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 so in this case, what's happening is that, um, if I can just go all the way back here. Alpha synuclein is doing many, many things. It's causing many, ab many, many abnormalities. And one, one, one may not be mutually exclusive, but, but you know, we can dissect it. In cell culture model, it seems to be causing these things independently, because we can study them independently. But, but obviously, in, in, a, in, a, in an in vivo context, these stressors are accumulating on top of each other. And, just like in the, in the case of unfolded protein response, if you alleviate one, one of these, if you alleviate one of these bricks in the wall, it's possible that the cell is able to better handle or compensate for some of the other pathologies, defects that are present. Or maybe some of those other pathologies not sufficient to cause neurons to completely collapse. So I think that we, we actually, we have to take a multi multifactorial approach, but, but then scientifically, we can only study one thing at a time. Hello, Dr. Lee. I, I think I read some of your papers because I also study AV3T transgenic models, but uh, we are not using the same model. I forgot, what problem motor did you use? You, you use PDF or what? I forgot. So th th these are prion oh. motor? OK. okay. So these are mice that, uh, that, that was generated in, in my laboratory. So what, uh, what are you using? Uh, we are also using the prior promoter. So you're probably using one from uh, Virginia Lee yes. group? Yes. So yes. that one you have to go homozygous to get pathology, whereas ours, uh, it stays as a heterozygous animal. And some of the, some of the strains that came from Jack's uh, at, at one point, they had to re-derive them because they lost a lot of copies. So they don't get sick anymore. But, the, but these animals are available at Jacks too, so you can get them there. Okay. So um, do you think um, the ER stress in your model will apply to uh, a lot of AFIB3T transgenic models, other transgenic models, alpha synuclein transgenic models? Yes. Yep. 
Okay, and also um, uh, you mentioned that the loss of dopamine might be uh, only the uh, tip of the uh, iceberg. Do you think the office nuclear pathology is, might also be the tip of the iceberg since Parkinson's disease is such a holistic disease? <laughs> I mean, yes. As you can see, the alpha synuclein is just a, a, a single event, whereas, you know, really the disease uh, represent, you know, is associated with a whole host of defects. But I think, I think in, in what, if you were, you know, in, in studying these, these cause and effects, I think we have, to, we have to kind of at least heuristically define where things are. And, and at least my perspective, based on you know evaluation of clinical literature and, and pathology literature and genetics, is that alpha synuclein is very upstream, and that the loss of dopamine neurons is more downstream of that. In other words, we believe that loss of dopamine neurons are 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 happening because of alpha synuclein abnormality and not the cause of the opposite nuclear abnormality. Now, also, I think so far, um, although we saw a lot of um, alpha nuclear pathology in post-mortem brain of Parkinson's disease patients, um, there's no study showing that uh, reducing alpha nuclear in Parkinson patients can attenuate motor deficits. How would you comment on that? Because there's no way to, re there has been any, there has not been a way to reduce alpha synuclein levels in brain, right? I mean, there's no, there's no approach for that. There's, there's no clinical, there are, there are no clinical um, approach that, that you can actually try this on humans yet. But, but, uh, but I'm sure that they will be. But in animals, we can, we can stop the disease by reducing alpha synuclein. So we have a conditional synuclein model, and, and they get sick, and you stop expression, they stop getting sick. Well, what's the difference of the term, term pathology between human and mouse? Pardon me? You mentioned the term pathology? Tau pathology, yes. Yeah, so the mouse, in mouse models of Alzheimer's disease, um, the wild type tau do not form perihelical filaments. Whereas in human disease, if you have amyloid deposits, it's usually associated with tau pathology. So, and also the, the mouse tau tend to uh, be much more homogeneous in terms of its isoforms. They have a different isoforms composition than the, than the human tau. So, and, and usually, um, uh, so, so Peter Davies and uh, Karen uh, Duff, they've shown that if you express human tau at a moderate level, uh, when animal ages, you can get, you know, a tau, abnormal tau uh, pathology. So, so idea is that the human tau uh, res is responding to some cellular pathologies differently than the mouse tau. I have another question. So uh, your model, <clears throat> I look at your, the lifespan of your model, it looks similar to uh, the model in Virginia Lee's uh, lab. And uh, are your model developed paralysis? It's almost identical. The, the two models are identical. The only difference is that, that Virginia Lee's uh, mouse have to be homozygous to get pathology, uh, you know, to get, to get the kind of pathology that you see at, at the reasonable time frame. Whereas we, we only need one copy. It just has to do with difference in level of expression. Oh, not only, and another difference is our model is congenic to C57 black 6, whereas uh, Virginia's C3H. model obviously is a, is a hybrid. Okay. Yeah. Do you imply that with this flow chart, alpha C nuclein also regulate parking, pink one, DG one? <laughs> oh, you, just, you are quick. <laughs> Yes, I, uh, actually, we, yeah, there, definitely. Do you have any evidence on this regulating mitochondrial dynamics? But I know DGA one somebody proposed is complex. Well, well I'm, you know, I, I don't think that there, it's been shown that uh, in vivo that PARC can regulate mitochondrial dynamics, at least not in brain. 
right? There is not a, I, I don't know any good evidence in vivo that Parkin, other than flies, flies. in mouse, there's a lot of mouse knockouts of Parkin, and I don't know any evidence that there is a mitochondrial deficits there. So, so there are a couple of things that could cause Parkinian inactivation as a consequence of opposite endocrine. There are two things that, that are known to inactivate Parkin. One is nitrosylation, and the other one is C able phosphorylation. And we know that alpha synuclein is sufficient, pathology is sufficient to cause both of those. And, and, and in fact, that, that may be the reason why when we, so we made it alpha synuclein transgenics to Parkin null mice, and you know, there was no difference in phenotype. In other words, the animal got sick just at the same time. I mean, they were both just virtually identical. That's probably because alpha synuclein is actively, um, so it's, it's one of the things. But you know, if you knock out Parkin in humans, you don't get all the other stuff. You only get loss of dopaminergic neurons. So, so, so obviously, Parkin is, Parkin abnormality is just a subset of all the other stuff. Um, I have another question. So since this model developed paralysis, it does, does not mimic uh, Parkinson's disease, because Parkinson patients don't develop paralysis at the late stage. So then do you think this model would be a, a good it's a, model? It's an animal model of alpha synuclein pathology, yes. Yeah? Thank you.